morning, everyone. Uh, so yesterday we started into our second chapter, which was uh, equilibrium. Uh, we started looking at reactions. Reactions are reversible, so some reactions can take reactants become products and products become reactants. Uh, the systems that actually head towards equilibrium will end up hitting this balanced state. We're going to hit this condition called dynamic equilibrium. I'm going to ask you a few warmer questions based on that. And then we looked at spontaneity. We looked at using an enthalpy argument and an entropy argument to figure out which reactions actually end up as equilibrium and which reactions go to completion. So just as a quick practice here for warm-up. Uh, first thing I want to just um, ask you here is, can you uh, define dynamic equilibrium? Yeah, so what is it um, when I am at a system of equilibrium? What happens? Uh, define dynamic equilibrium. Uh, second part here. Uh, I want to just specify a reaction. I'm going to have 2mg solid. It's going to react with O2 as a gas. I'm going to put a question mark because I'm going to ask you a problem here. This is the reaction as I've listed for you here. MgO is a solid. This is the, like you took a piece of burning uh, magnesium and you burnt it in the Bunsen burner here. This one here gave off that really intense white light. So this one here gave off a lot of energy. Uh, I want you to decide for me, does this reaction, I'm just going to put RxM for reaction, does the reaction go to completion? Does it just go forward and not come back? Does it reach equilibrium, EQM? Or is it a no reaction, is it a 0%? And in that case there, you need to decide um, the energy argument and the entropy argument. And then three, uh, let's do another reaction here. This is actually the elephant toothpaste demo. So I have two uh, H2O2 here. Um, uh, let's say plus heat. Uh, this one here becomes two H2O as a liquid. And then we have O2 as a gas. So based on that way I've written it, I just want you to describe uh, what happens to enthalpy and entropy uh, for the forward direction. All right. So I'd encourage you just to pause it, try it out for yourself, and then you can check your answers with me here. All right, so first thing for dynamic equilibrium, there's two parts to this. We think of equilibrium as a state of balance, right? So equilibrium actually specifies the concentrations of reactants and products. Concentrations are actually constant in time, right? So uh, however much reactant I have, that number doesn't change whether I look at it right now, 10 minutes from now, I look at it again, it still stays constant. What I want to emphasize again, concentration of reactants does not have to equal the concentration of products. Like that hockey game analogy here, even though I expect always five players on the ice at all times, uh, it's not that just five players on the ice means five players on the bench. No, that doesn't make sense. I can have 20 players on the bench, right? So those two numbers don't have to equal each other, but those numbers have to stay constant throughout the entire hockey game. What about the dynamic thing? In this case here for equilibrium, we have expected, well, things are in balance, nothing's changing. And yet in chemistry, we actually have dynamic equilibrium, meaning the reactions actually continue the reactions continue to occur. So how is it that we have uh, players constantly jumping off the ice and on the ice here? How is it they stay constant in time, even though the players themselves are actually changing? The conclusion to bring these two things together is this big uh, fact here. It's happening when we do the line change, the forward rate, if three players jump off, as long as three players jump on at the exact same rate, at the exact same speed, it's the speeds that are equal. It's not the amounts that are equal to each other, but the rate, the, how quickly they change back and forth, that's actually equal. Right? So that's the condition that we want to approach. Systems that uh, are able to reach equilibrium will naturally head there. Uh, we did some preliminary work in yesterday's lesson here. How do we decide if a reaction is likely to go to equilibrium or not? So this is a question number two is an example of that. What you need to remember is for this sort of spontaneity stuff, there's always two uh, two factors. Tell me, just for nature, nature tends to blank enthalpy and blank entropy. Remember, these are the two factors that we're looking at. Enthalpy was the heat uh, concept we talked about a lot in kinetics, uh, endothermic, exothermic, that sort of thing. If nature had its way, if the system did what it was allowed to do and it wanted to do, 
nature would always prefer to go to the side with minimum enthalpy because minimum enthalpy, the lower energy side, is actually more stable. What about nature wants to do in terms of entropy? Entropy is the amount of disorder, is the amount of chaos in the system here. Naturally, we have the second law of thermodynamics. Naturally, systems get more messy, right? Uh, things just naturally unwind. They don't uh, come back in a nice orderly fashion unless you put energy into starting to do organization. So maximum entropy here, uh, we want to actually have more chaos, more randomness. Things get more messy. So these are the two features that I want to test. In this question, as posed to you here is, I don't know. Are we going to go forwards as written? Are we going to stay on our side here? Let's deal with the minimum enthalpy side. We remember from yesterday, minimum enthalpy always points. So how do we know that? Points to the heat term. And if I point towards the heat term, that points in the exothermic direction. That points towards the low energy side. The heat term or the energy side is on the, react uh, is on the products here. So therefore, minimum enthalpy actually goes to the right. So using just an energy argument, of course I want to go forwards because that side here has lower energy. That side's going to be more stable than I am here. So that's one of the factors. The other factor here is the entropy argument. How do we tell which side here is more entropic, which side here has uh, higher chaos, higher randomness? We look at the states. We look for the most moles of the more random phase. And there was this ordering that we saw from yesterday Solids are really orderly, then come liquids, then come aqueous, then come gaseous. Right? So let's look for the most random phase on both sides here. The most random phase on the right hand side is solid, right? Okay, so solid on the left on the right hand side. On the left hand side we also have a solid and we also have a gas. Well gas is gonna be way more entropic than the solid. I don't really need to worry about the solid. The mess is being made by oxygen. But gases are gonna be way more entropic than than a solid. So in this case here, if nature had its way. If we want to go to maximum entropy, we're going to point towards the side with a more random phase, which is the gas. The most entropic one here would actually go um, to the left. In this situation here, because these two factors compete against each other, the right-hand side here is more stable. And yet I want to stay on the side here. Even though it's less stable, it's the more chaotic, it's the more messy side. I want to stay on the more messy side versus becoming more orderly as I go towards becoming a solid. Anytime these two factors go against each other, we know we're going to end up as equilibrium. Again, not immediately. It might take a little while to actually approach and actually reach equilibrium. But based on these factors, that's what nature wants to do. That's one way they can ask the question. You'll notice in question three, I ask it slightly differently. This time, what they do is they've given you the reaction the same way, but they're not uh, as a question mark over the arrow. They're not saying, give nature its way. What does nature want to do? They're actually forcing you to describe a particular direction. So as written, as the 2H2O2, as it becomes the 2H2O and O2, what happens to enthalpy and what happens to entropy? You can do the same work as before. Well, nature wants to minimize enthalpy. Minimize enthalpy always points towards the heat term. Minimum enthalpy wants to be to the left. Nature wants to maximize entropy, so we go maximum entropy. Don't just say enthalpy goes left or entropy goes right, things like that. Do specify which direction wants to go. Lower energy means more stable. S is the disorder I want to maximize. I want to become more chaotic. In this case here, the most chaotic state here on the left is aqueous. The most chaotic state is gaseous. In this case here, the maximum entropy goes to the right. We already know the system as written should reach equilibrium. But that's not what the question is asking. This question is forcing you to describe, I don't care what nature wants to do. I want you to just talk about the forward direction. So, well, what happens in the forward direction? As I go from two aqueous and it becomes one gas, gases is way more chaotic than aqueous, you can say, so we've sort of done this analysis ourselves, we can say that for the forward direction, the entropy increases, which matches up nicely with what we'd said. Maximum entropy goes to the right. As reactants become products, we get more chaotic. What about the enthalpy, though? I knew enthalpy wants to minimize. I know it wants to become more stable. The more stable side, based on the way I've written the energy term here, I know it's on the left-hand side, but I'm forcing you to describe the forward arrow. If I did go from left to right, I end up doing an endothermic reaction. If I do an endothermic, uh, endothermic reaction, I do end up with a situation where delta H is positive, and I do end up having energy higher. So in this case here, because we're forced to describe the forward direction, we say enthalpy increases. And again, you'll say to me, wait a minute, I thought energy is supposed to decrease. You're right. If nature had its way, it wants to stay on the left. But based on the way the question is worded, 
I just want to ask you, for the way I, written, I wrote the forward reaction, you are telling me as the entropy is increasing, the enthalpy is actually increasing as well. It's actually, it's actually increasing. It doesn't want to go to this side, but as written left to right, this side here is the more energetic side. It's like having gone forward for the forward reaction. So just watch out, there's those two ways of doing it here. For the rest of this chapter, pretty much we're going to be using that equilibrium symbol, and pretty much we're going to have done this in the background. We're going to work out, oh, these two factors actually compete against each other here. We're going to eventually hit equilibrium, and then we're going to do uh, some more work once, once it hits equilibrium. So in today's lesson here, I just want to introduce to you uh, a principle for equilibrium. We're going to call this Le Chatelier's principle. Uh, Le Chatelier principle. They always like asking this question here, state Le Chatelier's principle, right? So let me just write it for you here. For Le Chatelier's principle here, when a closed system at equilibrium is stressed, we'll talk about what these stresses are in a second here, but when a closed system at equilibrium is stressed, the system, or nature, system will tend to counteract uh, the stress or counteract the change. Okay, so that's what the Chatelier's principle says. Uh, let's just focus on some, some key elements here is notice the Chatelier's principle only applies when we are already at equilibrium. So if I have a reaction that doesn't go towards equilibrium, don't do the Chatelier. If I have a system that does go towards equilibrium, but we haven't quite gotten to the equilibrium yet, don't do Le Chatelier. It's only when we are already at equilibrium. How will we know we're at equilibrium? We're going to have this symbol here, sort of the reactants are becoming products, and the products are becoming reactants, not just it being reversible, we're saying we've actually hit equilibrium. We had said in yesterday's lesson here, especially for reactions that end up generating gas, I want to make sure that I'm in a closed system, so if I have gases that are released, I want to make sure the gases are in close contact with the liquid. I don't want it to escape. I want to give it a chance to actually re-enter the liquid. So in this case here, sort of equilibrium already implies closed system, but they just sort of reiterate that. What we're doing in the Chatelier's here is the equilibrium was happy. It was already nice and balanced, right? It's already settled out. Forward rays, you could reverse rate. But what we're going to do is we're going to poke at the equilibrium. We're going to stress it out somehow. We're going to look at these stresses here individually here. What you can do here is you can stress it out by changing the temperature, you can stress it out by changing the pressure or volume, you can stress it out by changing concentration. There's a whole thing you can poke at the equilibrium. And all the Chatelier basically says is the system itself, the equilibrium, on being poked by these stresses here, first thing is the direction is they're going to try to counteract you. They hate what you do. So if I increase temperature, the system is going to try to cool down temperature. If I increase the pressure, System is going to try to decrease the pressure. Nature is always fighting against you. That's the direction that nature wants to do. And also important in the statement here is nature may try to do it, but nature can, can't can really get rid of what we do. So even though if it says state Le principle, I want you to write uh, pretty much along those lines here. We can think um, just uh, conventionally here. Le Chatelier's principle essentially says nature hates what we do. Nature tries to undo what we do. So if I poke at it somehow, if I heat it up, nature's going to cool it down. Does nature like things cold? No, it just hates the fact that I heat it up. If I then cool it down, nature hates the fact that I cool it down, nature wants to heat it up. Nature is always fighting against us, right? So it's just something curious uh, in our universe, and nature's always against us. What we're going to do uh, upcoming here is I'm going to look at what are some of these stresses, and we're going to see, well, how does nature actually counteract you? How does it try to get rid of uh, the stress? Uh, let's do this in order here. We're going to start off with the temperature. Right? So temperature is something you can poke at the equilibrium. Uh, let's have a look at our equilibrium system again here. We're going to have N2O4 as a gas becomes 2NO2 as a gas. So I realized, I know yesterday I was mentioning that one of these gases here were brown. I think it's actually the NO2 that's brown, but that would be given to you. You wouldn't have to memorize that. So I have a colorless gas on the left side. I have a uh, brown uh, colored uh, gas on the right hand side, the 2NO2. So notice that we have reached equilibrium. So meaning outwardly, these guys here are just sitting in the container. I have a bunch of NO2s. I have a bunch of uh, N2O4s and NO2s. 
pretty much the brown coloration stays, right? Because I'm not creating way more NO2s and I'm not losing the NO2s here, right? This reaction as written is endothermic, so I'm going to say plus heat, right? So that's the system as it is outwardly. Let's talk equilibrium first, okay? Macroscopically, macroscopically, uh, the system remains um, sort of a constant uh, brown color intensity. Okay. Again, I'm not asking you why the chemical is brown, but just if it is brown, it's because of the NO2 molecule there. And pretty much what that means is I'm going to have a bunch of NO2s in here. And although uh, microscopically the reactions still occur, although the N2O4 is constantly I'm going to take N2O4s and they are constantly becoming NO2. Wouldn't that make the brown color a stronger color? Well, as that happens, we're actually going to have two of these NO2s also recombine to end up reforming N2O4. So microscopic reactions still occur. That's really important for this dynamic equilibrium. Microscopically, the reactions still occur, but uh, they are at the same rate. At the same time, one N2O4 becomes two NO2s. Two NO2s would then have converted themselves over to N2O4, and therefore I have the same NO2 concentration, concentration of NO2 uh, constant in time. It's not like over time I get more NO2 or less NO2, so therefore the brown color intensity just stays. Right? So that's the equilibrium. This is the uh, setup so far. Right? We have already hit equilibrium. Now what we're going to do is we're going to apply Le Chatelier, because Le Chatelier says for an equilibrium, you can stress it out somehow. You can poke at it, right? Usually just some terminology here. The thing that I do to the system, that's referred to as a stress. Even though the factor that I'm interested in is temperature, I need to tell you whether I'm increasing temperature or decreasing temperature, right? Because those are opposite directions. For argument's sake here, let's say the stress this time here is I increase the temperature. The equilibrium was happy as it was, right? It was forward rate equals reverse rate, no problem. And now what I do is I come along as I increase the temperature. I take the entire container as it were, and I basically heat up the particles. Um, what the system is going to do is the system is going to try to fight against me. It realizes that this whole container, let me put it underneath a Bunsen burner or something like that, let me just heat up this entire box here. The system wants to cool down the container. Notice that the equilibrium is sort of stuck in the box, though. It can't just release heat to the environment, just like I'm putting heat uh, inwards. So what's going to happen here is the system, all it can do, the terminology we're going to use is the system can actually shift. Equilibrium will either shift left, will actually force the NO2s to become N2O4, or it's going to shift right, take some of these N2O4s, and actually go to the um, right. In this case here, um, the shift, the direction is the system wants to decrease temperature, right? I told you um, nature just hates what we do. It's not that nature likes things cold, but it just hates the fact that I increase the temperature. If you look back at this reaction then, well, I have two possible directions I can go, right? Based on this reaction, if I run a couple more forward reactions, the N204 is going to absorb some of that heat and is going to end up becoming NO2. So that heat will no longer be in the environment here. It's going to be locked away in the bonds. That's going to be a way that I can actually reduce the temperature. Or in contrast, let's say the NO2 actually shifts over. Let's say the NO2 actually becomes uh, N2O4. In this case, that won't happen because as the two NO2 here becomes N2O4, they would end up releasing heat. That would even add extra heat to my stress. So in this case here, the direction that helps me is, we can say in our terminology here, our equilibrium shifts right, or you can say it shifts towards products. So N2O4 absorbs some of that extra heat that I've done by heating the entire box, absorbs the extra heat uh, to form NO2. It sort of locks away the energy as NO2. All right? so no doubt I am taking this equilibrium system, it's inside the box, I'm heating up the entire box. Because the system wants to cool down this container here, the system is going to preference the N204, which was already at equilibrium, I'm going to force more N204s 
grab some of that heat, absorb it in, store it in bonds, and that way it will fight to try to cool down the temperature. Notice then I'm going to take the colorless thing and I'm going to make the sort of brown colored molecule. Over time, what's going to happen is this uh, NO2 is going to steadily become more and more of a deep uh, brown color. So what are the conclusions here? So that's what the system wants to do. It wants to fight against me. So as that shift happens, as the equilibrium sort of responds, what's going to happen to the N2O4? Well, more N2O4 is going to get used up to become NO2. Uh, as this shift happens, we are decreasing N2O4. I'm losing N2O4. And as I shift to the right, as I create more NO2s, lock away some of the energy, this is going to increase the NO2. I mentioned the NO2 here is the thing that actually appears brown. So what's going to happen is this uh, equilibrium, as it shifts, is going to become more of a brown coloration. Right? So that's what we're going to do. We are applying the Chatelli's principle. There's always going to be a stress of some sort. I'm always poking at the equilibrium somehow. And the question will be, what does the equilibrium do to respond against? What does the system do to try to fight against you? Just for completeness sake here, remember I said temperature is just a factor. I could stress it out by decreasing temperature. Right? That's something else I could do. Again, the system is going to shift. The system is going to try to fight against you. What the system wants to do is the equilibrium. Uh, in this case here, I'll just give it to you right away. The equilibrium is actually going to shift left. Equilibrium shifts left. Or you can say it shifts towards reactants. To um, produce or to release more heat. What's important for you to realize here is the equilibrium is stuck in this box. The equilibrium can't just suddenly leave. All the equilibrium can do is it can either let's run more of the forward reaction or let's run more of the reverse reaction. In this case here, I'm going to run more of the reverse reaction because as I cool down the entire container, the NO2 here. It's going to force some of the NO2 here in becoming N2O4. That's going to then release off extra heat, and that heat is going to work wonders in trying to fight against my decrease in temperature. Again, it's not that nature likes things cold. right? Nature just hates what we do. Nature is always fighting against us. Right? All right, so let's take a look at the next stress. The next thing I can poke at the system. This system, uh, I can stress it out by a concentration change. So let's take a look at another equilibrium here. Uh, let's do CO2 as a gas, reacts with NO as a gas. This one uh, is carbon monoxide as a gas, and we have this side NO2 as a gas. This happens inside our catalytic converters in our cars. Basically, when you combust your fuels, uh, it first starts off producing these poisonous gases like carbon monoxide and NO2s through the catalytic converter. It actually converts it into slightly more stable forms that we don't uh, accidentally uh, poison ourselves. So. Again, it's important, before we even talk about Lechitelli, it's important that we are already at equilibrium. At equilibrium, what does the system look like? There was no mention of what temperature I'm at, so I don't know exactly the amounts. Maybe I have two CO2s, two NOs, and maybe I only have one CO and one NO2. Right? Just to start introducing to you, again, at equilibrium, we should have both reactants and products. The um, reactions are continuing to occur. The CO2 and the NO are constantly combining. These are creating CO and uh, NO2. But why is it not just sort of overall macroscopically? Why are things uh, staying constant? Well, as that happens, the CO and NO2 that I have is constantly releasing CO2 and NO. So that at any given time in my box here, I have two CO2s and I have um, um, two NOs. So that's what it means by equilibrium. Notice the concentrations don't equal each other. I have two CO2s, but I only have one CO, so be it. That's fine. The concentrations, the hockey game doesn't have to have the same number of players on the ice as benched. What am I going to do this time? Concentration is a generic uh, factor. I can stress it out somehow. This time, my stress is I actually increase the concentration of NO. Now, how would I do that? It's as simple as, well, I have some NO source outside the box, not part of the equilibrium, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add NO to the system. I'm going to artificially add a bunch of these NOs that wasn't there to begin with. That's something I'm poking at the system. The system was already at equilibrium, it was already happy, it already matched up reverse rate and forward rate here. It doesn't like this factor that you suddenly have so much NO. Again, all that the system can do, it's going to try to either shift left or shift right. The goal is you suddenly increase a bunch of NO. Will the forward reaction or the reverse reaction, which one of those will actually get rid of the NO for you? 
So what's going to happen here is the equilibrium wants to remove some NO, right? The thing I poked at it was I added a ton of NO uh, at a given time here. It doesn't like suddenly having so much NO. The forward reaction involves CO2 colliding with NO and forming CO and NO2. Oh yeah, that would surely get rid of NO. Or the reverse reaction forces CO and NO2 to produce yet more NO. Well, no, I don't want to create any more NO. I already have so much NO. So in this case here, as I increase the NO, we can actually make a prediction because nature fights against you. Nature will prefer the forward reaction. That's going to force some of the CO2s that I already had in the container to react with some of the NO. It's going to collide together. It's going to end up forming CO and NO2, and it's actually going to bring down the concentration of NO. So equilibrium wants to uh, remove some NO by uh, shifting. Which way does it lean towards? By shifting right or shifting towards products. Uh, we're going to study these factors once more in tomorrow's lesson uh, based on graphs, but just a quick introduction for that here. I'm going to plot concentration against time, sort of the amount against time. At the beginning, we had, I'm just going to plot the sort of NO uh, chemical for you. At the beginning, we were at equilibrium. At the beginning, we already had a set number of NO present. Even though microscopically the reactions continued to occur, the number of players were constant in time. So how you know on this graph here we're at equilibrium is that the concentration doesn't change as time takes onwards. What I do is I decide to stress it by increasing the NO all of a sudden. Usually they call this T1. I suddenly increase this all at once. I pump in a bunch of NO. Nature doesn't like that. The Chatelier kicks in. The Chatelier says, okay, I'm going to let you shift left or shift right. Try to get rid of some of the NO. It's going to shift to the right. It's going to cause the CO2 to collide out some of those NOs. They're going to become CO and NO2, so be it, but it's going to help me bring down the NO concentration. So the NO went suddenly up. That was the stress. So all that occurred right at that one instant. And then during the shift, as time goes onwards, as the CO2 steadily kills off the NO, the NO concentration will steadily drop. This one here is going to steadily come back. And here's that last sort of important uh, wordage here uh, from the Chatelier's principle. It's going to tend to counteract you. It's going to try to counteract you. It never really gets its way. It never gets you back to a situation where we initially had an equilibrium where we had this much NO. It's going to try to bring us down. So in the shift, it's going to try to decrease the NO. But at the end of the day, you'll notice we still have more NO than we had beforehand. So this is going to get a little confusing here. We did the stress. The equilibrium response that wants to shift to the right. I'm going to ask you, compared to the initial or the original equilibrium. Can you tell me what happens to the concentration of do the easy ones first? Can you tell me what happens to the concentration of CO2 compared to the original? Well, at first, the CO2 was just minding its own business. The CO2 was constant in time. Notice the CO2 doesn't need to match up with NO. So the CO2, this value here is sort of fixed. As I run more of the forward reaction, I'm going to lose CO2 particles to have collided with the NO. So all that's going to happen is the CO2 is going to steadily drop. There's no increase for the CO2 side. So CO2 decreases. In a similar fashion, as I run the forward reaction more, I'm going to create CO and create NO2. So what happens to those two? The CO and the NO2, both of these ones here go up because they are, happen to be products, and I'm shifting towards the products. I'm creating more of them. Fine. The hard one is going to be the NO. A couple things happen to the NO. Graphically here, the stress has already increased the NO, right? It went way up. During the shift, it tries to get rid of it. It wants to decrease the NO. But in this case here, what I'm asking is, by the time we re-hit equilibrium, compared to the initial equilibrium, when NO used to be down here, you notice the NO is actually higher. Compared to the initial equilibrium, we're going to still say NO increases. You're going to get confused. Well, I thought NO was supposed to be decreased. It did decrease. It's just when I write NO has increased here, I'm sort of saying, just maybe in words it makes more sense, uh, the NO is higher than the beginning. Because in fact, a lot of things happen. The stress had already increased it. During the shift, I am trying to pull it down, and yet all I'm saying here is the NO is higher than what it was to begin with. Right? So uh, just for you to think about here, what if my stress was something different? So another concentration feature, this time instead of adding NO, let's say what I do here, I take this reaction, and what I decide to do is I end up removing, I'm going to just try to create this clear for you here, the stress 
is I end up removing NO2. I pull out NO2 out of the system. Again, the system was just minding its own business, and all I do is I remove a bunch of this NO2. As I remove out the NO2, the system doesn't like the fact that it's lost so much NO2. Would it shift right or would it shift left to recreate the NO2? Which direction would produce more NO2? Hopefully you're able to see to me here, well, because NO2 is a product, I need to shift towards product, I need to shift to the right to try to regain some of the NO2. I'm never going to get back to what it was initially, but at least the equilibrium here, this is the shift. The equilibrium is going to shift right to reform some NO2. Never gets it back up to what it was uh, totally at the beginning, uh, but that's what it's going to try to do. So for this Lichitelli stuff here, that's all we're interested in. We're trying to say, I'm going to poke at this equilibrium system here. Can you tell me how the equilibrium responds? Is it going to shift towards the left or the right uh, so that it tries to fight against me? Right. Uh, third factor here, we're going to deal with pressure and volume. Again, throughout this course here, when we're talking about pressure and volume, we are specifically looking at gases. And remember this one here, uh, these two are inversely proportional to each other. Let's take a reaction here. This is called the Haber process. Uh, 1N2 and 3H2, these are all gases. They are currently in equilibrium with 2NH3. Right? Remember, you don't do Lichitelli unless you know you're at equilibrium. Right? We'll do some problems with the math later on where we're not at equilibrium yet. I'll show you how that works. But in this case here, we are at equilibrium already. I have some number of N2s. I have some number of H2s. I don't necessarily know exactly how many. And I also have the products present here. I have some numbers of NH3 as well. So at any point, we are already at equilibrium. Constantly what's happening is one of these N2s is finding uh, three of these H2s. Right? That's the ratio. As that happens, this is going to generate two NH3s. Microscopically, that reaction still occurs. The forward reaction happens. The two NH3s here, they're going to collide together, and they're going to end up releasing off one N2 and three H2s. So microscopically, reactions still occur. It's just that the rates are actually equal. What we're going to do here, again, I'm going to poke at the system. We already were in the container that was yay big here. Let's say this time, my stress, how I decide to poke at it, my stress is I actually increase the pressure. Right? Because pressure and volume are opposites, you can talk about the stress also being a decrease in volume. One way I could increase the pressure is I squeeze this balloon, I squeeze this box here tighter than it wants to be. Suddenly, I'm going to be in a container that's like this suddenly all these particles here, they don't have as much room as they had before. How they're going to fight against me is the system is going to try to shift to save space. So this is the shift, or this is the response. Equilibrium responds by trying to save space. Again, the equilibrium is stuck in the container. It's not like I can, oh, let's while I'm not looking, let's pump out some of the N2. That's not what I'm doing. The equilibrium, all the particles are still there. All the equilibrium can do is equilibrium can either shift right or shift left. And what's going to happen here is I know I'm trying to save space. I don't have that much room anymore. In this case here, how do you decide which side saves space? We happen to have four moles of gas on the left, two moles of gas on the right. This time, what equilibrium is going to do is I'm going to shift to the right because I'm going to take the room that four particles would have taken up. I'm going to convert four particles, trade it in for two particles. As I have lesser number of particles, the less particles that I have, the easier it is to sort of save space. So equilibrium responds by trying to save space. Uh, so therefore, it ends up, I'm going to shift right to convert four uh, gases into two gas. And therefore, I'm able to save more space. And therefore, it shifts right. And I can ask you the same sort of conclusions. Well, then what happens to N2 and what happens to H2 during this shift? Well, as I shift to the right, as I preference the forward reaction, the N2 and H2 as reactants, these two have to drop. As the NH3 is on the product side here, as I shift to the right and make more of it, that one there is going to increase. And again, I want to emphasize here, this is not a stress. This is not, oh, let's come along and let's pull down the N2 or whatever. This is just what naturally happens as the system response as the system shifts right. The stress was already done back here, right? I decided to poke at the system in this fashion, and what the system is going to do is going to try to save space, right? Uh, lastly, I'm going to do one more factor with you, save the easiest one for last. The last feature here is adding a catalyst, right? 
So hopefully you remember from our kinetics chapter here, uh, catalyst is something that you add to the system. It provides an alternate mechanism, provides an alternate pathway, gets you from the same start to same finish by lowering the activation barrier. So if you take a look at a catalyst here, let's do a potential energy diagram, let's plot it against reaction. We're going to have a, let's say, an endothermic reaction. This one here, I'm going to label the EA. Remember, plot the reactant line over and point towards the activated complex. This is the EA of the uncatalyzed reaction. That barrier here was way too high. What a catalyst does is it provides a different detour. It gets you from the same start to the same finish, maybe not all in one step, maybe it takes, I don't know, two steps. But it eventually does get you to the final product. But what you're going to find is the activation barrier for the uh, catalyzed pathway is actually somewhat lower. What I want to show you in this case here, so maybe you can make that note to yourself here, uh, catalysts provide an alternate, a different pathway. The name for pathway we used last chapter was mechanism. Catalysts provide an alternate mechanism with a lower energy barrier. I don't need to have the really, really fast moving particles. It's an easier way to get from start to finish. And what I want to show you in this case here, well, for our equilibrium stuff here, reactants are trying to become products. Reactants try to climb this hill. As the catalyst has made the hill a lot lower, sure, a lot of reactants can become products a lot easier. But as I've decreased the barrier, that also decreases the rate. Well, if I'm product and I'm trying to go back towards reactant, I don't have to surmount this big hill myself. I don't have to surmount this EA reverse. I also need to just surmount a tinier hill, maybe another tiny hill later on. I've made the pathway easier on both sides. So therefore, uh, equilibrium does not shift since both reactions are faster by the same amount. So I made the reaction easier for both reactants to become products and products become reactants. Right? So try out some questions, see if you can identify for yourself based on a particular stress, based on how I poke the system, how the system is going to respond to try to fight against that stress. Thanks, guys.